And you, you talk very much in the book about slavery as a business. I mean, you, you talk about you know stock and supply of materials and you know demand and it, it, is that I mean that that would be very surprising I think for people to think that human beings are being commoditized almost in, in this way still. They are actually, and uh, the reason why I decided to write this book was uh, because uh, one of my previous book um, dealt with uh, child pornography and child abuse, and I, I uh, published some of the names of people that were linked to this international uh, sex trade with children and teenage girls and boys, and um, some of them were senators, governors, uh, rich men, entrepreneurs. I mean, it, they weren't like the, the ugly guy in the alley, back in the alley, but these guys that were finding it attractive to somehow pay for having sex with certain kind of children, like um, girls from the US that were really blonde and blue-eyed. They wanted them to be brought to them, to Cancun, to have sex with them in a very fancy and nice uh, place, in a nice hotel in Cancun, in a safe environment in which they could pay up to three thousand dollars for a girl that was a virgin for, for them, and uh, so I published that book, and I, I had all the evidence on these guys. I published their names, and on that book tour, people kept asking me, "How does this mafia? How are they able to bring all these girls and boys from one country to the other? This is so strange because we we see this in the news. We Everybody keeps telling us, giving us numbers, but we want to know how. So um, I, I decided to follow the mafia, so I made a list of all the mafias that were buying and selling the, the children and the women and, and around the world. And I decided to go at it from all the perspectives, right? Not from the poverty perspective, but from the economist perspective. I, I understood there's a lot of money moving around, and uh, I wanted to know exactly why. So um, I follow the trail of the money, and uh, that's it. People, they are making tons of money. Uh, in, in Mexico, the last numbers that we have is like uh, the, the organized crime has earned in one year $400 million of selling human beings, of human trafficking not only for the sex industry, but also for, for slavery, which you know very well because you've written about the uh, forced labor, slavery and stuff like that. Yeah, and it, what, what I found fascinating was, was that you sort of compare this to drugs and, and guns and actually identify this as a growth market almost for mafia groups. That they can make more money out of trafficking human beings than they can out of trafficking narcotics. Yes, I interviewed this guy that was in jail uh, waiting for his sentence in, in California in a U.S. jail. He's a Mexican. And he started off in the drug trade business and he ended up working in one of the networks that was uh, buying girls in, in Tlaxcala in the center of Mexico and selling them to brothels in New York and, and in Los Angeles. And when I asked him, why, why did you get into this? And he said, you know, it's very simple. One kilo of cocaine, you, you know, you sell it once. A little girl, you can sell it 100 times. So you make far more money from selling human beings and from selling drugs. And it's far easier because once you have the control of this person, either a child or a woman or a boy, uh, then you, you can do whatever you want. They trust you or you have power over them, you have their papers if you, send, uh, if you move them from one country to the other. So it's like you own them. And he found it really powerful and he, he thought it was really easy. You, it, what I found quite interesting early on in the book was, was the way that you actually went a lot into the psychology of how these guys actually control women. And, and some of the tricks that they use, some of the, 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 the coercion, the, the fear, the risk of, there's, there's a point in which you talk about the damage that they can do to their reputation that almost removes them from their, from their community. I mean, the, the psychology in the book is, is absolutely fascinating. I thought it was really important to explain people, regular people like us, that why, why is this happening? Because 15 years ago, uh, sex, trafficker would, sex traffickers around the world, mainly the Russian mafias 
and uh, the Jakusa Mafia in Japan, uh, which have been, you know, we've seen uh, many, many movies about these guys. Um, what they did was they gave, were giving drugs to the, to the teenage girls or to the women to stay in the brothels. But um, as soon as journalists started talking about this, the whole thing started changing. And then uh, they found out it was simpler for them to get um, girls and uh, boys in this market to feel two things two, that are really important. One of them is to feel that their captor is taking care of them. Which is, he, is, he or she is their owner, but it's also sort of their parent in this uh, loving, sort of perverted way. And then on the other hand is um, they train them. You, you, if you want a slave to behave properly, when we're talking about the sex industry specifically, uh, what you want is for them to understand that this is a um, profession, that it's not a crime that you are committing, um, using their bodies and their integrity. So what, what they do is they train them with pornography. And this I found because uh, when I interview all these little girls from, from the first uh, uh, pornography network that I uh, discover in Mexico, um, all the little girls from 10 year old to 14 years old, they all told me how these guys were showing them pornography all the time. They were normalizing sexual abuse, sexual violence in many ways. They were teaching them how to feel aroused, sexually aroused by pornography, because it's the best way to teach someone how to exercise and accept violence as a way of interchanging emotional uh, eroticism, supposedly. So um, it was really important for me to explain this, because nowadays it's really hard for, for young women uh, to get away from a network in which they have been captured because not only because in some cases they do are addicted to drugs, but in the cases that they are not, because they are addicted to violence, because they are taught to be addicted to violence. And I wanted to uncover that, to explain that, so people can under understand that this is not a choice, but it is a form of um, also psychological slavery and training. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very sad when you, 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 ident you, you go to a, a shelter where some of the children or young women have been rescued from, from this life. And um, you describe how that behavior, that sort of sexualized behavior has been so normalized that they find it really difficult, even when they've been taken out of the environment, um, to change, change those patterns of behavior that they still express love and affection in, in those sexual ways. Of course, they, they, they've been eroticized in such ways that they don't know any other way to express their emotions or feelings. So that this I found in Mexico, in Venezuela, in Colombia, in Argentina, in Kyrgyzstan, and uh, in, in Cambodia and Thailand, is these little girls that have been rescued and they're, they're going on like psychological treatment and they are being educated. But uh, once they, they, they feel safe, and uh, if they like you, for example, I was playing with them and giving them candy and, and you know laughing with them, and all of a sudden they, they, they try to touch me uh, and act, they start acting very sexual. They, they immediately start fl flirting and going like this and you know, going like, looking like an adult woman that is flirting with someone. And uh, the issue here is very complex. They don't know how to share affection in another way. They are over-sexualized and they do believe that uh, erotic expression and sexual expression are the only way to thank people for whatever they give them, either if it's money or food or candy or help, because that's why they were they were educated into this this uh, form of slavery. So I, I I tried to explain that in the book. And uh, you know, explain it really well. And it's it's a point in the book when. I'd been asking myself as I was reading it, how do, how do you possibly deal with, with all of this? And it, you meet some fascinating and, and very tragic characters, May and Dar, the, the two women in Southeast Asia. And that, there seems to be a point then in the book when you, you almost kind of crash because you have this emotional response 
to, to that very tragic behaviour. Was that the, the hardest aspect of researching the book, kind of protecting yourself from those experiences? Well, it is, it is always hard to interview. If you do it properly, when you interview victims, it's a huge responsibility. Um, but then when you interview victims of these kinds of crimes, or not only victims, uh, also survivors, of course, which is a difference for, between a victim and a survivor, but um, it, it touches you in, in deeper ways. Um, and then it changes you all the time. Every, people, every human being you get in contact with uh, changes you forever. And it changes the way you do journalism. And uh, in some um, places, like Cambodia, I was really shocked because probably everybody in this room, as what we do as journalists, knows that everybody talks about Cambodia and Thailand as the places where pedophiles go and look for little children to, to rape, uh, to buy off, uh, to have sex with. And, um, and then you get there, you go to the airport, and they give you these papers and these brochures in which they said that uh, sex slavery is uh, avoided in, in Cambodia, that the government is in control of that. And all of a sudden, you get there, you go to all the places, and they are there. There's like all these brothels everywhere. And you see these tourists, uh, mainly from Europe and America and uh, the United States and Canada, uh, flaunting around with little children that you can tell is not their own. Uh, um, and they don't care. They do it openly. And um, it's, it's, it's devastating to see that a lot of people see them, you know, walk by with, without doing anything. Um, and I don't know, one day in, in Phnom Penh, I, uh, after doing all these interviews, uh, I was chased by part of a mafia because I found this limo uh, that said, I was looking for proof, I needed evidence. So I found, finally found um, the Chinese mafia leader in, in Cambodia, Phnom Penh, owns the biggest casino. And I went to the casino and I found this limo that had this little name on it that said, little girl um, uh, limo services. And it had a little pink flower. And it meant that they would bring clients to little girls to, to be uh, abused. And uh, so I was chased by them. And I went to my hotel room. And I, I noticed that there was nothing but like the door you know, to, to close it. They didn't have a chain or anything. So I, st I started moving all the furniture to the door. And it was so stupid because, like, yeah, sure, they have guns and they own the country, you know. They, the, the owner of the, the leader of the Chinese mafia in, in Cambodia is the, the advisor for the economy minister and the tourism minister in, in Cambodia. And I knew that, so I was like, okay, sure. But anyway, I was there, I went to the bathroom, and I stayed there crying, like, for an hour. And I was like, what the hell am I doing? But then. Uh, then I thought my job was useful. So, so after you'd written your, your book in, in 2005 about child pornography and every gangster in Mexico wanted to kill you, you thought you'd mm. go and make sure that every gangster in Southeast <laughs> Asia <laughs> wanted to kill you. Did you talk to my father <laughs> before doing this interview? 